Thanks very much, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. So the, this project was conceived at the Reef Summit that I'm sure most of you, or many of you, were at a few years ago that led to the Reef Blueprint, blueprint for Resilient Space Management. And it's sort of grown out of some of the work that we and AIMS and CSRO have done in developing the Resilient Reefs Network with assisting Gabrumpa team under Roger Beden's leadership. So we've just been taking that work forward. All right. So, all right. so just to start with, I'll just briefly ask, well, what is resilient space management? We hear this term frequently. And it's really about managing uh, to enhance natural processes of a system. And that means you need to work very much with the ecosystem. And essentially, if you can understand how that system works, you can try to sort of supplement it uh, where it's best uh, used. It doesn't necessarily change the kind of intervention that you do. It's really more about prioritizing where and when you do those things to get the best ecological outcome. And in order to do that, you need to have some ability of understanding how the system works. And so uh, my team and our collaborators have been developing uh, detailed models of the reef for a number of years now. And those are uh, sophisticated models that model individual groups of, of species. So there's six types of coral that are modeled in there. And we link these models directly to e-reefs so that we can try to build that bridge between what the physical environment is doing and how corals respond to that. So we can incorporate much of the great empirical work that's done, for example, in the CSIM, and then put that to use in uh, models of how the whole system's going to work. Um, so, you know, it, things like effects of water quality on fertilization success of corals can be included in this way. We also calibrate the model using the best available recent data on different disturbances from the reef. So, COTS information, cyclone impacts, the more recent bleaching mortality, those data are then embedded explicitly into these models. And what's very important is that we undertake quite extensive independent testing of those model behaviors and ask to what extent can we actually resolve the kind of reef dynamics that occur at individual reefs. And for that, we're comparing our model hindcasts to what's been observed in the AIMS LTMP data at more than 100 sites. And it's, not, it's never going to be perfect, but generally it does a pretty good job of capturing the dynamics of individual reefs. So I want to talk about three different things that came out of this project. The first one is asking the question, which reefs are most important to promote recovery after a bleaching event? Where might you want to really put high value on, on the surviving reefs, the ones that have lots of coral? And the best way to think about this is if you imagine a set of reefs, and if you know something about how connected they are by larval dispersal, you can start doing some prioritization. So looking at this, for example, you would see that these two reefs have the greatest number of connections to other reefs. And if we look at the state of the reefs that they're attached to or linked to, we see that this reef is, it's not a particularly clear slide, I apologize, but this reef is in good state and it's connected to four other reefs in pretty good state. This is an area, let's say, that didn't get very badly hit by the bleaching event, but one of the reefs did. It's now in a state of low cover. In contrast, this reef is connected to one pretty good reef and four really quite recently damaged reefs. And so arguably, if they're both important sources of coral larvae, then this is the one that's going to be most important uh, at trying to provide coral larvae where they are needed right now. And so we've developed an algorithm to identify those reefs using the best available information. And so it looks at every reef of the GBR and asks, which are the most important source reefs for reefs in need? So you would prioritize reefs that produce lots of larvae. Maybe they are larger reefs with a higher coral cover. You look at whether that reef is in the right position to deliver an important contribution of larvae to reefs downstream. And also, especially if the reefs that are being uh, receiving those larvae are reefs in need. Reefs that have recently been damaged are in an early stage of recovery. Um, and lastly, we try to pick local priorities within each region. And much of the data for this has come from uh, RIS surveys, it's come from the Great Reef Census, it's come from our model hindcasts, 
of the level of coral expected on each reef based on the history of disturbances and recovery potential over the last decade. And so what does that look like? Will you end up with a map like this, where the sort of light blue points you can see there scattered up and down the reef are those reefs that are predicted right now to have the greatest potential to supply larvae where they're needed and help that recovery process after these recent bleaching events. This data set, these layers, were uh, provided to Cabrimpa in March as part of their ongoing identification of COTS control prioritizations. As Roger said earlier, there's a whole series of data considerations in making those decisions. This is one of them. Okay. So the second thing is, is a slightly different question, but this is, again, based on this idea that some reefs are much more ecologically important than others at certain times. And here we've been working with Damien Weekers at Cabrumpa to look at the role of knowing this and refining compliance priorities. These are um, patrols to uh, prevent uh, fishing in green zones. And so for this, we've done a few things. So on the left here, we have a map of the key source reefs. This is the most important key source reefs of the GBR overall. We then took the uh, commercial vessel sightings data that the authority has, and we use that to create a new layer of essentially commercial fishing uh, intensity. And of course, where that occurs in, in green zones and so forth, that is a potential threat in that case. And we recognize that although there's the understanding of how fishing damages reefs is, is there's a lot to learn about that, but there is sufficient evidence to think that anchor damage-like problems follow from a variety of fishing activities. We also looked at recreational fishing, and what we did there was adopt the models that Damien and his colleagues at CSRO have developed to predict the probability of recreational fishing across the reef. So we have recreational fishing, commercial fishing, and information on where the most important ecologically important sites are from a coral dispersal perspective. And so if you were to plot, uh, this is an example, if you were to plot the connectivity value, this is, if you imagine the y-axis is a sort of ecological value against the intensity of commercial fishing, you'll end up in this top right-hand corner, which are areas of high importance from a commercial fishing perspective or a high risk of commercial fishing, but also of high ecological importance. So there's potential conflict here. And where these reefs are in green zones, then this is a consideration when prioritizing those missions. If you have two reefs of similar risk of poaching, but one of those reefs, reefs is a more important source of coral larvae, then perhaps those reefs would get higher priority. So that's ongoing. And the last thing I'll talk about briefly is trying to predict management benefits. Now, before I studied my PhD, I was working in Belize designing marine protected areas, and it was a really frustrating, albeit a great, experience. And one of the things that was frustrating is that we had very little science to guide what we were doing. We were just using um, principles and common sense. But at no point could we ever predict what's the outcome going to be of making this area a protected zone for this. We just had to hope for the best. And you know, for me, we're trying to get in a, in a situation now where we can try to make some predictions of how reefs will respond to different management uh, scenarios and help guide that process. So we've been working with uh, Cabrumpa in developing a Great Barrier Reef Resilience Management Tool. This is a Windows software that boots up. And what it's attempting to do is to create feasible futures for the reef. No one will ever be able to predict the actual future of the reef, of course, but you can hopefully create feasible futures where the coral's going to go up and down depending on which disturbances occur and when. But if you make that sort of prediction and then you alter the management and then you repeat the prediction, so the same disturbances at exactly the same time and locations, you can ask, to what extent does that management lift the future of that reef and give you a management benefit or a management impact? And that's what this is trying to do. It's trying to use these models to integrate the science to do comparisons of a potential future and then the same future with the addition of some management that's been added. And the idea is if you can find those combinations of management that give you the better returns, then that's something to consider. 
And so when you boot this software, the first thing it allows you to do is to pick whichever reefs of interest you have. You can pick according to uh, management zones, um, you can geographic regions, aims sectors, you can go in by hand and pick particular locations, whatever you want. You can define sets of reefs that you either want to study and look at their response to management or sets of reefs that you want to apply some interventions to. You then create a design scenario. And the sorts of things that that allows you to do is first of all set what's your time scale of interest. So it might be, for example, 2020 to 2050. That allows you to set how many runs would you want to look at. You might just start with one. You can pick the climate change scenario that we're following. So we have models in there that you can select from for each of the major emission scenarios that the world is, is facing. And also you can switch to different levels of intensity the extent and type of fishing that's there. This is again bringing in those data layers that we've developed um, or, or adapted in this case for recreational fishing. So you set up your current situation and then you define the interventions of interest. And so at the moment we have a few interventions. The first is you can select a water quality intervention. And this has really been possible from work that the Queensland government has been supporting. And so there's been some important work modeling the catchments. Those models were then used with e-reefs. E-reefs ran future, so today's water quality scenario, what would happen if you achieve the water quality improvement program targets by 2025, and then even more aspirational outcomes. And what we do then is take those e-reefs outputs and embed those as options in the model. Um, in terms of COTS control, you can select which reefs you want to control. You might select a particular region and say, well, we're just going to get 10% of these or 20% of those or a specific set of reefs. You can define when you want to start, when you want to stop, how often you want to do it, and so forth. And of course, you can define different interventions um, and compare how well they, they fare against one another. Another one is anchor damage. So this is parameterized from some really nice work from the Keppel Islands. And this can also be used to get a sort of sense of what fishing damages might be and how you might avert those damage by extra compliance. And lastly, this is in particular response to some feedback, was because there has been evidence that corals in green zones tended to fare better, there's Camille Mellin's paper, for example, that there was a desire to capture the ability to include that in the explorer, even though we don't really know why at this stage. But you could then put in a little offset and say that reefs in green zones or whichever zones of interest have a certain increase in coral cover on average, and you can distribute that across species or, or whatever you like. So again, it allows you to create a scenario of some value to you. Okay. Um, you can then run those scenarios and compare them one against another, or you can do some sort of simple optimization where the human designs a series of interventions and says, well, this is the question, this is what we're trying to do, but then ask the computer to try and find good options that try to achieve that. And that's something we've built in. And you can optimize on the type of coral, um, the density of cots, whatever you like. So at the moment you then hit run, the software takes about two seconds to run a scenario for say from now until 2080. So it gives you an answer pretty quickly. Um, and then you can view the results in a variety of ways. So for example, you can review the actual trajectory of the average of those reefs you're interested in. Or you could actually look at the comparison of the counterfactual without, the man so that's without management then the intervention with management and look at the management benefit and how that benefit changes over time, which is that, for example. So this is now measuring on average across that region of interest, this is how the management benefit changed over time. Of course, you might instead want to look at the management benefit on individual reefs. You can pick those too. And of course, you can then run different scenarios, plot them on the same graphs and compare the outcomes and use this as a more of exploratory tool to find out what sorts of interventions work well together, what not so much. Okay. The other thing we've added is to try to capture different reef states. So you can define what you consider to be excellent, very good, fair, poor reef states based on coral cover. So you can manipulate that 
And then after a particular intervention, you can ask, so what was the change in state of reefs in my area of interest over that time period? So for example, if you were interested in the reefs that started off being good, it will tell you, in this case, that, um, that uh, nine reefs remained in a good state, 36 reefs went from good to fair, but the majority went from good to poor. This was a, just a random selection of things, not very optimistic, I know. Um, but that allows you to sort of uh, try to tie into some of those aspirations that have been in the Reef 2050 plan. Okay, and then you can also then drag the slider along your software, along your uh, time scale, and look at how the reefs are actually changing in state over time. Okay, so I won't bore you anymore with the details of this software, but to summarize, what this is trying to do is to integrate available science to support decisions and to start allowing people to play out different scenarios. You know, what happens, we've talked a lot this morning about multiple stressors, and there's a limited toolbox with which to, to uh, work against them. So what combinations of management seem to work well together under a particular set of disturbances? The process has gone through uh, two rounds of revision and consultation at this stage, which has really changed some of the ways that this is uh, designed. We believe it can be used in practice. It is, it is good to go, as it were. But I actually think perhaps its greatest value is it's a tangible tool to help scientists and managers collaborate. You know, I mean, I've certainly been party to a lot of conversations like this. And so what could we do? But it's not until, in my view, you have something in front of you that you can play with, that you can really start to uh, progress that conversation and get into details of what sorts of ways would you like something to help make those decisions? What are the greatest ways of benefiting the decision-making process? And I think in that way, I hope that we will succeed or possibly temporarily fail together as a collaboration between science and management. Um, I also think this is kind of timely given that there's now a whole series of new programs, all of which have a decision support component. And I think what's learned through this process can help inform those broader programs over the next few years. So I'd like to end by, again, thanking the NESP for the support of this, thanking Dr. Gabrumpa for your collaboration, and also point out John Headley for his help with the software.